My son, since I got him from his grandmother, after she threw him out, he's been doing a lot of really weird things, like drinking his own urine. He's pooped all over the house, smearing it everywhere. Anything, anything that looks suspicious. But oh, yeah. Really? Oh. What the f*** do you mean? They cannot resuscitate him. That's what the f*** I mean. For the set last six months of Naven's life, he was tortured, beaten, starved, and imprisoned. The death of Naven Jones prompting officials to reinvestigate the decade-old death of his infant half-brother. On March 29th of 2022, eight-year-old Naven Jones was found unresponsive in his home in Peoria, Illinois. When police arrived to the home, they found Naven living in deplorable conditions and described the boy as being literal skin and bones. Weighing just 30 pounds and suffering severe starvation, Naven passed away at the hospital later that day. This is the case of Naven Jones. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you are new here. I wanted to start off this video with apologizing to you guys for my lack of uploads lately. I've been kind of struggling trying to figure out where exactly to focus most of my time. Some of you guys may know that I do also have a TikTok channel where I try to cover executions, I cover recent cases, things like that, and there have been so many new recent cases that I've been focusing so much time on my TikTok. But moving forward, I do want to put more focus focus onto my YouTube channel, so I am going to be trying to post a little bit more on here, maybe at least once every two weeks. So with all of that being said, thank you guys again so much for being here, and let's get into the details of this case. Naven Jones was born on December 7th of 2013 to the parents Brandon Walker and Stephanie Jones. Unfortunately, DCFS was already involved with this family at the time of Naven's birth. In 2007, years before Naven was even born, Stephanie Jones' three-month-old baby, Nigel, had passed away. At the time, it was believed to be SIDS, however, it was later found that the baby might have passed from an unsafe sleep situation. But we will get into more details regarding Nigel's death towards the end of this video. In 2010, Stephanie and Brandon had their first son, who was placed into foster care after he was born. He was placed back into their custody just two years later, in 2012. When Naven was born three years later, he tested positive for opiates, so he and his older brother were immediately put into the custody of DCFS. Later on, the boys were placed into the temporary custody of their grandmother, Brandon's mother, Laura Walker. However, the boys were returned back to Stephanie and Brandon just less than a week later. In December of 2017, when Naven was just four years old, DCFS had received several reports to their hotline regarding the safety and welfare of Naven. One of the calls was regarding an allegation that Stephanie had spanked Naven so hard that it left severe bruising on his bottom, and this was later proven to be true. That same year, his grandmother, Laura Walker, obtained legal guardianship of both Naven and his older brother. In June of 2021, this was reportedly the last time that Naven had ever been seen by the doctor. And at the time of his appointment, he weighed in at 43 pounds, and this will be an important detail to remember later. On July 10th of 2021, Laura Walker had to leave the state to fly to Florida to take care of her mother, who was severely ill. Before leaving, she left Naven and his brother in the care of their parents, Stephanie Jones and Brandon Walker. It was reported that she was gone for a few weeks until she came back on August 1st, and when she went to go retrieve the children, Brandon and Stephanie refused to give them back to her. On August 17th of 2021, DCFS opened an investigation after Stephanie and Brandon refused to return the two boys to their legal guardian, Laura Walker. Laura also reported that the boys were living in a filthy home that was covered in trash, and she was obviously concerned for their safety since they had previous incidents with abuse in the past. 
On the same day of August 17th, Laura did go back to the home and attempt to get the boys back again. However, this time, Stephanie ordered her to get off of their property. So Laura went back to her car and this time called the police. This is the police report that was taken on that day. On the listed date and time, I, Officer Willis, responded to 2050 North Gale in reference to a custody dispute. Upon arrival, I spoke to paternal grandmother at her vehicle outside of the residence who advised that she was the legal guardian of older sibling and Naven Jones. Paternal grandmother reported both children were currently at the residence with their biological parents. Paternal grandmother reported she took custody of the children in 2017 due to the mother, Stephanie Jones, having an issue with drug addiction. Paternal grandmother advised she had been in Florida for approximately six weeks helping her father who was in poor health. Paternal grandmother stated she allowed for both of the children to stay with her son, Brandon Walker, and Stephanie. Paternal grandmother reported that she wanted custody of the children due to them starting school in Washington, Illinois this week. Paternal grandmother stated when she arrived at the residence, she texted Stephanie to bring the kids out and she did not respond. Paternal grandmother stated she then went to the door and was threatened by Stephanie to get off the property. Paternal grandmother reported she returned to her vehicle and called the police. Paternal grandmother then provided me with Tazewell County Court Order 17-P-122 that stated paternal grandmother was in fact the legal guardian of both children since 4-28-17. I asked paternal grandmother if there was anything preventing Stephanie or Brandon from having custody of older sibling in Navin, and she said no. Paternal grandmother stated it was her decision when Stephanie and Brandon could have custody of the children. I then spoke to Stephanie and Brandon on the porch of the residence. Stephanie reported the following in summary. Stephanie stated her and Brandon have had custody of older sibling for the past two years due to paternal grandmother not wanting the kids together because they fight. Stephanie reported that they have had custody of Navin Jones since June 2021 when school got out. Stephanie advised her and Brandon have not been back to court to get legal custody of the children. Stephanie reported that paternal grandmother is trying to show her power by taking the children back due to being mad at her for not letting Naven go with her the other day when they were swimming. Stephanie stated she did not want either child to go to paternal grandmother due to them reporting she has been mistreating them in the past. I again spoke with paternal grandmother who reported she was done dealing with this and was just going to go back to court and have the children to be put into foster care. I then asked if it was okay for the children to stay with Stephanie and Brandon since she did not wish to deal with them and she stated no. I requested a supervisor to respond and Sergeant Lawrence responded to the scene. Sergeant Lawrence was briefed and spoke to both parties. Paternal grandmother decided she did not want anything to do with the children or Stephanie and Brandon and left the scene in her vehicle. I assured both children were okay staying with Stephanie and Brandon. I then provided Stephanie and Brandon with a case number and advised them to go back to court and get legal custody of the children. On August 18th and August 19th, DCFS workers went back to the home of Stephanie Jones and Brandon Walker in an attempt to see the children. However, both times they did not answer the door. On August 19th, Laura went down to the police station in hopes that they would possibly help her get the children back. An officer contacted Brandon, and Brandon said that he would bring the children back to Laura, but two days later, they never showed up. When the officer called them again to check where they were, they stated that they took the children over to Chicago, and they weren't really sure when they were going to be back. On this same day, it was discovered by DCFS that the children were not enrolled in school. On August 24th, Laura contacted the police to file a missing persons report for the children since they were not being returned back to her and nobody actually knew where they were. When the officer called Brandon stating a missing person report would be filed for his children, he stated he did not care what any paperwork says and he will not be returning the children to Laura and he's not even in the same state anymore. After this, the children were entered into the Leeds database and officially considered missing children. On October 14th, a DCFS worker finally got a hold of Brandon Walker. He told her that they had moved to Florida and they were not going to be moving back to Illinois. He did also tell her, however, that they had a doctor's appointment for the children on the 21st and he was going to be back to Illinois that day and he agreed to let the caseworker see the children for that day. The following day on the 15th, the caseworker called the doctor's office to see if they had any upcoming appointments for the children and they did not. On October 21st, CPS received confirmation from Florida Child Protection that Stephanie and Brandon had no history of abuse in Florida. 
They did not bother to check any other states, not even the state they had just moved from, which was Illinois. On November 3rd of 2021, DCFS closed the investigation regarding Naven Jones, and they listed the August 17th complaint from Laura Walker, where she stated the boys were living in a filthy home in a dangerous environment. They listed this as an unfounded complaint. At the time this was closed, DCFS still had no knowledge of the whereabouts of the children or their current condition. On November 4th, the detective working on the missing persons case for these children requested that the case be closed and the children be removed from the Leeds database. On February 14th of 2022, DCFS launched a new investigation due to an anonymous complaint regarding Naven. This complaint stated that Naven had a black eye, he was locked in the basement often, he was not enrolled in school, both children were often dirty, and the other sibling was often forced to go to work with Brandon almost every single day. The person who reported this also stated that they were told by one of the children that Naven had recently gotten punished for getting up in the middle of the night and trying to eat chicken that Stephanie had cooked for the dogs. And that whenever Stephanie did not want to deal with Naven or if she just wanted to take a nap and not listen to him, she would tie him up and lock him in the basement for hours at a time. Now, DCFS attempted visits several times throughout this week. However, every single time, no one answered the door and they were unsuccessful. When they finally spoke with Brandon, they asked him why the children were not enrolled in school, and he stated that they were not enrolled because him and Stephanie did not have legal guardianship. So for him, if he doesn't have legal guardianship of his children, he's not going to bother enrolling them in school, he's not going to bother getting them doctor's appointments, he's not going to bother really doing anything for them. Now something that I'm very curious about that obviously none of these documents have is when he responds saying, oh well I didn't enroll them in school because I don't have legal guardianship, what do they say to that? Do they just say, okay, let me go ahead and write that down? Like I... Isn't that a problem? Are we going to figure out how to make that not a problem? Are we just going to ignore the fact that the children aren't in school? Are we also going to ignore these several abuse allegations? I'm really confused what's happening here. On February 22nd of 2022, DCFS was finally allowed a visit to see the children. And this date is extremely important and extremely infuriating. On this day, DCFS worker Kathy Harvey was the one to speak with the children. She stated that when speaking with the children, they both said that they felt safe in the home and they denied ever being harmed by their parents. They also denied any of the allegations regarding the punishments or being locked in the basement. Kathy Harvey observed Naven to be sickly in appearance and very thin and small in stature. When she asked the parents about this, they stated that he ate often, but he was never able to gain any weight. Now, there is a photo of Naven that was taken of him at some point within the last few months of his life. I was originally under the assumption that maybe this photo was taken at the last DCFS visit, because in my opinion, it does seem a little bit closer to when he passed away. But I have had people message me and let me know that that photo was taken by a concerned friend when they came to visit. I am unable to confirm exactly who took this photo or when it was taken, but I do feel like I need to show it. I want to give a major trigger warning before showing this. It's going to be very hard to look at. It is a photo of Naven where he is visibly malnourished and in a very skinny state. It's a shocking and horrifying photo to look at, but also a very important photo to look at. It's very important that we understand how bad Naven truly was. And I also think that when you all look at this photo, you will truly understand how ridiculous it is that DCFS did not take Naven away the day that they saw him. Now, with that being said, if you would like to skip past this photo, if you don't feel like you can handle it, you can do this by clicking forward to the timestamp I have listed below. Now, absolutely no one in this world is going to sit here and tell me that this boy was well-fed. Not a single person in this world is going to tell me that this boy was eating and just not gaining weight. 
no one can convince me this, and I don't see how these parents were able to convince this CPS worker who was literally trained to see things like this. How were they able to convince her that this boy was not starving? I truly don't understand. Now, again, Kathy observed Navin to be extremely skinny, and she stated that she was concerned for his health. When Kathy told Stephanie and Brandon that Navin should be seen by a doctor, they told her that they would love to take him to the doctor, but again, they don't have legal custody of Navin. So again, they are using the legal custody thing as a reason to not only not enroll him in school, but not take him to the doctor. So again, Kathy was there regarding allegations that the boys were being abused and that Navin was so starving, he broke out of his room to eat food made for the dog. And she was there to actually witness Navin being extremely skinny and, in her words, sickly. But Kathy stated that when she asked the boys about the abuse, they stated that none of it happened. And when she asked them if they felt safe with their parents, they stated yes. So I want to take a pause right here and actually talk about why children in severely abusive situations like this would actually lie about being in an abusive situation. But let's think about it, though. These children, who are not enrolled in school probably never ever see anybody else other than their parents, and really don't know anything else other than the abuse that they've been subjected to their whole entire life. The only people that they truly know and the people that they are supposed to trust the most in this world are the very people that are subjecting them to severe abuse. If the people they trust the most in this world are doing this to them, how on earth could they trust strangers? Imagine being a small child that doesn't know anything about the world, and all they know is the abuse that their parents put them through every single day. If they fear their own parents, imagine the fear they have towards complete strangers. If the people they trust the most are capable of doing horrible things to them, what do they think strangers are going to do to them? So of course they are going to say that they are safe. Of course they are going to say that these things didn't happen to them, especially if you ask them right in front of the people that is doing it to them. I just can't wrap my mind around this. CPS is supposed to be trained to see the red flags. They're supposed to be trained to see things like the fact that Naven is starving when they're there regarding a complaint about him being hungry. I just cannot wrap my mind around this. I, I just can't understand this. So after Kathy Harvey observed Navin Jones to be sickly thin, and after he told her that he felt just fine with his parents, she left and left him there. One month later, on March 29th of 2022, police were called to the home of Stephanie and Brandon after they found Navin was unresponsive. Let me make that clear, just in case you guys didn't hear it the first time. One month after Kathy Harvey visited Navin, he was found unresponsive in his home. What's the address you need the ambulance at? 1717 North Dale. Is that a house? Is that a house or an apartment? It's a house. Okay, what is your callback phone Back number? Damn it. I'm sorry. What's your phone number? Tell me exactly what happened. I, my son, since I got him from his grandmother, after she threw him out, he's been doing a lot of really weird things, like drinking his own urine. He's pooped all over the house, smearing it everywhere. Um, sometimes he'll eat a whole bunch. Sometimes he doesn't want to eat at all. Okay. What's he doing today, ma'am? So, I'm sorry. What's happened today? I went upstairs because I hadn't heard from him and found him unresponsive on the floor. Is he breathing? No. Okay. I am sending the paramedic. I CPR before I called you guys, and I can't get anything. Okay. Uh, is there a defibrillator available? If so, send someone to get it now and tell me when you have it. I don't have one. Okay. I am sending the paramedics to help you now stand the line, and I'll tell you exactly what to do next. He is an adult, is that correct? I'm sorry. How old is your son? Eight. He's eight? Yes. Okay. Are you with him right now? Yes. Okay. I'm going to help you. I know you said you've tried CPR, but we're going to go through this. Okay. Tell me when you're ready. What's your name? <laughs> Ma'am, what's your name? Stephanie Jones. 
home. All right, Stephanie, listen to me. Are you home alone? Yes. Okay. I want you to lay him flat on his back on the ground and remove anything yes. under his head, okay? Yes. Tell I, me when I that's did. done. I removed his clothes and he was cold, so I put him in the shower and used the hose. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Okay, how long ago did you find him? <laughs> Maybe ten minutes ago. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and do compressions. I'm going to tell you how to do chest compressions. I want you to place the heel of your hand on the breastbone in the center of the chest, right between the nipples. Okay. i got to put you on speaker. That's fine. Please do that, Stephanie. Okay. I want you to put one, place the heel of your hand on the breastbone in the center of the chest, right between the nipples. Put your other hand on top of that. I want you to pump the chest hard and fast at least twice per second and two inches deep. Please let the chest come all the way up between pumps, and we're going to do this until help can take over. I want you to count out loud so I can count with you, okay? Okay. Start. Yeah, so I think they're here. Someone's knocking on my door. Is your door unlocked? No. Okay, go unlock it and come right back immediately. Hey, Calvo. Um, is there a... Really? Uh, is anyone inside? Chavez is in there right now. Uh, okay. Way underway. He's only, he's just scared. Um, apparently they have had some of this best interaction. Turn up towards 1717 North Dale. Apparently there's a uh, custody dispute right now. Like grandma dropped the kids off here at the biological parents. Yeah, she said vacation. Yeah, well, I'm Adam, 75 on Gale. Adam, 75 on Gale. Last night. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I okay. On the porch, both of them. Nine seven eight. 
Okay. But that's Who's this? In the so in the blue. The blue is coworker. They work down at a shop where the old rock tire used to be okay. on Jefferson. Okay. That's Dad Brandon. Is, right? Is right here. Yeah, Brandon. Okay. She told or he told me I talked to him on the phone. Right, right, right. But he saw him yesterday at like 3 p.m. Yeah, that's 623. Um, he woke up at like 6 today to go to work. Yeah. So he said okay. he left the house around 6:15. So I'll want, I'll definitely, all three of them are going to need to go down. Um, all right. And he's in the bathtub now, I guess. No, they, or they, they took him out. got him out of the bathtub. They were trying okay. to sit here on the floor. But, okay. Um, you want all the spellings and stuff? Yeah. Right, so Naven is the kid. Naven. Oh, I got him. Okay. Yeah. Stephanie? Okay, I got her. Got her. Just Brand, the Dad, Brandon. Brandon Walker. Okay. 12581. All right. Her too. Okay. okay. Uh, what's the coworker's name? Sorry, I said it. Okay. DCF, because they just unfounded the most recent. I'll let you guys know. I, mean, I know for sure, yeah, all three of them are going to okay. need to go down there. Okay. So we'll get Are right, you Stephanie? Yeah. All right, I'm Detective Chavez. I'm going to be investigating this, okay? I'm going to be out to talk to you a little bit, but you can start what we're going to do is we're going to go down to the police station, okay? So it's a little more private, it's warmer, and that way we can talk about what happened, okay? All right. You want to go there now? Yeah, all, all three of them. All three of them. Yeah. Officer Hope is going to take you down there, okay? I don't. Uh, sounds like they might transport. Uh, so pretty much just tell you kind of what's going to have to happen from here, okay? So I want to take a quick pause right here. Notice the reaction from the man in the blue shirt as Naven is being carried out of the home by paramedics. 
Now, I believe this man is one of Brandon's co-workers, at least that's what it sounds like based off of this body cam footage. His face is obviously blurred for privacy reasons, but even with his face blurred, you can see the very visible reaction from him when he sees Naven's body being carried out. Whether that's because Naven's unconscious, or whether that's because Naven's extremely malnourished, I'm not sure. But either way, you can see a very visible reaction from this man, even with his face blurred. Neither Brandon or Stephanie had this type of reaction. Neither of them had really any reaction at all when they saw the tiny skeletal body of their son being carried into an ambulance. They're going to take him to the hospital. And we're going to have to take you down to the station and she's going to be transported down. I just talked to him last night. I just talked to him last night. And again, there's nothing I can say to make this an easier situation. Um, there's no, I, there's no fucking, there's no fucking way. There's no fucking way, bro. There's no fucking way. He was fine last night. He paired all the conversation with me. things kind of get rolling um, because the detectives are going to have to secure the house and make sure that we figure out what happened. <laughs>
The best way to do this is try to put your palms together. So let me uh, like turn your wrists like that. What's that? Well, I didn't say they'd make it together. I just said, yeah, that's all right. I'll make it more comfortable for you. I'll put you in two sets. Best way to do that is put your palms together like you're praying. No, behind you. There you go. What I'll do since uh, we'll leave it like that, and I'll put you in two sets, okay? I'll make it a little bit easier for you. Yeah. A lot of people have that issue. So we'll put you in two sets. Okay. Right there. Let me double lock these cups. On this morning, Stephanie Jones called 911 after she found that her son was unresponsive in his bed. She claims that she took him down to the shower and put him in a cold shower where she attempted to revive him, but he never woke up. In the body cam footage of officers that were at the scene, you can see an officer refer to Navin as malnourished as fuck. When paramedics arrived at the home, they immediately noticed that Navin was just skin and bones and he was severely malnourished. Paramedics attempted CPR on Navin in the home and then transferred him into the ambulance where they gave him medication to stimulate his heart. But unfortunately, Navin was pronounced deceased shortly after he arrived to the hospital. Brandon Walker and Stephanie Jones were arrested the following day on March 30th on first-degree murder charges. The older boy was taken into the care of DCFS and eventually placed with the foster parent. Photos that were taken in the home show a fridge and pantry both full of food. Navin's older brother's room was just like any other kid's bedroom. He had a full bed with sheets and blankets. He had toys throughout the room. He had clothing. He even had a TV and a gaming system. Navin's room, however, was a lot different. Navin's room had one bed with no sheets or blankets, one dresser, and one singular toy. The closet door in Navin's room was originally locked, but when they finally got it open, they saw that it was covered in urine and feces. The door to his room did not have a doorknob and instead was tied shut from the outside with a rope. A note was written on the door from Stephanie saying, quote, Do not give Navin any food or drinks. Do not let him out of the room. He has what he needs until I wake up. End quote. There was also a camera inside of the room that was monitoring him 24 hours a day. Photos of Navin were taken at the hospital showing how extremely thin and abused he was. He was so thin that most of his bones were visible through his skin. His entire body was covered with bruises and abrasions, and his wrists were severely bruised, meaning that he was likely restrained. An autopsy was done on Navin that confirmed the following details. Navin showed various signs of chronic malnutrition and lost the entire layer of fat that is underneath the skin. He weighed just 30 pounds at the time of his death. Again, at his June 2021 doctor's appointment, he weighed 43 pounds. So he lost 13 pounds within that year, even though he should have gained weight. Even his organs weighed less than normal. So for example, his heart should have weighed 150 grams, but it only weighed 90 grams. His muscles began to atrophy days prior to his death, meaning he was likely not able to get up or walk, or even barely move for the days leading up to his death. He had bruises and other wounds throughout his body consistent with blunt force trauma. He had bed sores all over his back, suggesting that he was often forced to lie down for hours or long periods of time. He had severe bruising around his wrists, meaning that he was often restrained. And she testified that Navin died as a failure to thrive due to malnutrition. In Navin's case, he was starved for several months until he finally went into cardiac arrest on March 29th of 2022. It was found that Navin was often locked in either a dark room or the basement for hours with no way out. He was often tied up and restrained, and he never had access to food, water, or even the restroom. He was punished for eating out of the family's trash can. He was punished for eating food specifically prepared for the family dogs. He was punished for urinating in his room even though he was locked in there and unable to get out. He was forced to endure ice baths repeatedly, 
Brandon would even force the older brother to participate in the abuse, forcing him to place Navin into the ice when he was being punished. From the day that Navin was born, his parents treated him worse than the dogs. They treated their own son worse than an animal. It's truly just, it's heartbreaking. Thank you all for being here. Today, my office obtained first degree murder indictments for Brandon Walker and Stephanie Jones, the parents of eight year old Navin Jones. In those indictments, we alleged brutal and heinous behavior in the death of Navin that make each of them eligible for a life sentence. As you are probably aware, pursuant to earlier court records, police were contacted March 29th regarding an eight-year-old not breathing. When police arrived, they found Navin unresponsive, emaciated, with sunken eyes. He weighed just 30 pounds. At the hospital, doctors later found ligature marks on both wrists. During the investigation, police observed the defendant's house to be well furnished, except for Navin's room. Inside Navid's bedroom, they found one toy, one dresser, and one bed that had no sheets, no mattress, and a pillow that didn't even have a pillowcase on it. There was a padlock on his closet door, and inside that closet was a horrific odor of urine and feces. The door to Navin's bedroom had no knob on it and had been tied shut with a string. There was a sign on the outside of his bedroom door that read, quote, do not give Navin any food or drinks. Do not let him out of the room. He has what he needs till I wake up. We assume that note was for his older brother. My office's review of those facts, as well as the discovery of additional shocking conduct by the defendants, led to the addition of the brutal and heinous counts that we added today through the grand jury. As well, we have filed a motion to increase both of their bonds that will be heard on Thursday when they're formally arraigned on the new charges. The shocking conduct that I'm referring to includes text messages between the defendants where they discuss locking Navin in his room, tying Navin up in the basement, beating Navin because he had urinated in his bedroom because he was unable to open the door to go to the bathroom. In the 911 call, the defendant Jones first complains about Navin before she even tells dispatcher that, she's, that he's not breathing. To one of the complaining about Navin, and it's not until the dispatcher asks defendant Jones, why are you calling? She then says that Navin's unresponsive. 53 seconds into that 911 call with that particular dispatcher. During the autopsy, it was discovered there were blunt force injuries on Navin's face, body, arms, and legs of varying ages, showing chronic or ongoing physical abuse. Pursuant to records of the school year when he was in first grade in the year 2020 and 2021, the staff then reported no problems with Navin eating, using the bathroom, or of his behavior. In fact, he was very social and, quote, thriving. At that time, he was in the care of his grandmother. It was later that year in 2021 when the defendants took Navin. With his parents, for the set last six months of Navin's life, he was tortured, beaten, starved, and imprisoned, all by the two people there to protect him. The defendants spent the last several weeks of Navin's life doing nothing for him. And I plan on spending the next several of mine bringing him justice.
On December 7th of 2023, Stephanie Jones agreed to a plea deal where she pled guilty to the murder of her son, Navin. She is scheduled to be sentenced on February 7th of 2024. On December 11th of 2023, the trial for Brandon Walker began. Brandon's defense team placed the blame solely on Stephanie, claiming Brandon worked long hours and Stephanie was the one that was expected to care for Navin. He also claims that he was really unable to do most things for Navin, including getting him medical attention, getting him a doctor's appointment, getting him into school, anything that had to do with the welfare of Navin, because again, he did not have legal custody of Navin. Despite living with Navin and having to care for him and refusing to return him back to his legal guardian, he still used the defense that he could not care for Navin properly because he did not have legal custody. When Brandon testified, he stated that he saw Navin two days prior to his death and he was just fine. He stated that they watched a movie downstairs, and afterwards, he watched Navin walk back upstairs, even though the coroner testified that Navin would not have been able to walk for days prior to his death, meaning that this was absolutely impossible. During the trial, several text messages between Stephanie and Brandon were revealed, where they discussed keeping food from Navin, restraining him, locking him in the basement, and several other things that really just prove what kind of monsters these people are. One of the text messages stating, Navin has been trying real hard to get his hand out from being together. And Brandon responds to that saying, not cool. In another message, you can see Stephanie saying, I now have several spots of piss to clean up. I told Navin he's being tied up downstairs at night. Him standing in the corner next to the bed and purposely pissing on the wall and carpet is not okay whatsoever. In one of the messages, Stephanie discusses whether they are going to lock Navin up in his room or they are going to lock him up in the basement. Stephanie texted Brandon saying, quote, He has to prove to us that he can listen and behave before we can leave him alone. Here's what I was thinking. Either he can sleep downstairs and I'll let him up or he can sleep up here and before you leave the house, you can put him down there and when I get up, I'll let him up. So to break it down for you, what Stephanie is saying here is that either Navin will sleep all night locked in the basement and she will let him out when she wakes up or Navin will sleep all night locked in his room. Then early in the morning when Brandon leaves for work, he is going to wake Navin up, put him in the basement and lock him in there until Stephanie wakes up. Either way, Navin is locked in a small room. And what's even more shocking is Brandon's response to this text messages discussing where they are going to lock up their son at night is he responds in some kind of flirty text message. Brandon's response to that text was, quote, either one is okay with me, you cute, furry lady. It's really just absolutely vile behavior. DCFS worker Kathy Harvey testified that even though Navin was very thin in appearance and appeared to be sickly just one month prior to his death, she did not believe it was critical. And she stated that even if it was critical, she did not believe she really had any authority to do anything about it. Instead, she called Laura Walker the day that she visited and pushed for her to sign over legal custody so that the boys could finally get some medical treatment. So instead of doing her job and protecting the children and taking them away from a bad environment, she pushes the legal guardian to sign custody over so that hopefully they can finally get seen by a doctor. Laura Walker testified to this, stating that she only signed over her legal guardianship in hopes that the boys would be taken to the doctor to get some help. She was told that this was the only option and she was extremely worried for them. She stated, quote, I was afraid for his health. I was afraid something was critically wrong. The caseworker insisted that this was the only way to get medical attention, so I signed it and I sent it. Kathy Harvey testified that she did receive the paperwork from Laura in the mail. However, this was on March 29th of 2022, the exact same day that Navin died. Many detectives testified to the horrid conditions that they found Navin in the day he died, as well as the horrible conditions of the room that he always lived in. Detectives testified that the camera in Navin's room captured the exact moment that he took his final breaths, but Stephanie did not call 911 until several hours later. The jury was shown the body cam footage when officers arrived on scene, and they found an extremely emaciated and unconscious Navin lying in a bathtub. 
All of the responding officers and the first responders struggled to get through their testimonies as they tried to describe the condition of Navin. Stephanie was brought to the stand where she did plead the fifth and refused to speak. She was shown a photo of Navin at autopsy and she began vomiting into the trash can. It is believed that Stephanie agreed to a plea deal where she would testify against Brandon in return for a certain sentence. However, she did plead the fifth, so I'm very curious to see what her sentence will be now. On December 15th, after just a four-day trial, the jury took only 45 minutes to find Brandon Walker guilty of the murder of his own son, Navin Jones. Brandon is now scheduled to be sentenced on February 28th of 2024. After the death of Navin, an investigation was reopened regarding the 2007 death of Navin's brother, three-month-old Nigel Reagan. The boy reportedly died at his home in Washburn, Illinois, but it was ruled as SIDS at the time. When the investigation was reopened, it was discovered that Nigel did not pass away from SIDS. He actually passed away from asphyxiation. It is believed that this was likely from an unsafe sleep environment, and he was possibly suffocated in his sleep. There was no evidence of physical abuse or trauma to the body, so they will not move forward with exhuming the body and actually confirming the cause of death. The cause of death has officially been listed as asphyxiation, so there will likely not be any signs of additional trauma at this point anyways. And I think that everyone can agree that this baby boy should just be able to rest in peace. So I'm not sure if this is just me, but cases like this make me feel so defeated. DCFS and CPS are both in place specifically to help children, yet they keep letting them down. They keep failing these children. How many times is this going to keep happening? How many more children have to die horrible deaths for something to change? And when are workers going to start being penalized for ignoring these bad situations and failing to protect these children? Kathy Harvey failed to protect Navin Jones. She could have protected him that day and possibly saved his life, and she didn't. And at the very least, I do not think that Kathy Harvey deserves to be a DCFS worker. And unfortunately, Navin Jones is not the only case that this has happened to. There are many, many, many cases of children that are just ignored by CPS or DCFS. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. If you have made it to this part of the video, I really appreciate you sticking around to hear all of Naven's story. And I genuinely appreciate every single one of you being here. I appreciate every single one of you being subscribed. It truly means the world to me that you guys even watch my videos. Please, if you have a moment, like, comment, or subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.